Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of DadCast. This one is super special. It's going to be a bonus episode for season number four, which is what we're currently in right now. I am your host, JP. Joining me as always is the man, the myth, the legend over there, Mr. Nick Martin. Hello. What's up? Oh, it's my bedtime. It, I know. Well, you know, <laughs> when you get up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning every day to work out, that's what happens. No yawning allowed yet, man. Come on. I know. I, yeah. Sun hasn't even gone down yet, Nick. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Joining us today, um, he has a few, and, and, a, and by a few introductory things, uh, one of them is fairly new, at least at least for us when we got to hear of him, but uh, he is now virally famous nationwide because apparently, and looking at you right now, I can see it, but not as much as those pictures. He has been come famous because he looks like, and they're dubbing him Dwayne Johnson, the rocks look alike, but he is Mr. Eric Fields, Lieutenant in Morgan County, Alabama, uh, for the police. Uh, how are you, man? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. You know, yeah, the, the dome, absolutely. The body you're ripped and huge. I, I guess if we got a little bit of the profile, it would look like the pictures of the rock, but you know, but it's the glasses. It's the glasses. Let's put those glasses on right at the, there it is. Now raise Whoa, an eyebrow. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. For all intents and purposes, awesome. we have Dwayne Johnson on dad cast. No, he is Lieutenant Eric Fields. Uh, is it Morton County, Decatur, Alabama? Yes. Yes, it is. And I'm assuming because you're on the show that you are a dad. I am. Absolutely. I'm a dad of a six and a seven year old. Six and a seven. Now, boys, girls. Two boys. Two boys, man. Isn't it? Isn't it amazing? Isn't it being <laughs> a dad to boys just awesome? Don't get me wrong. Girls are great too, but it's just. Mm. <laughs> well, every time we see another a child, my wife hollers, uh, "We need a girl," and I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" Because <laughs> a girl, me and a girl. So <laughs> it's been. <laughs> It's been an argument back and forth. She wants a baby every time she sees one. Is that option still on the table for you? <sighs> it is because they grow so fast and you miss, you know, you, you know, you look at pictures back when they were just barely walking in chubby and, and you're like, ah, you know, I, I don't want to give that up. So it's, it's not, I would never tell her that, but it, it is an option. Well, I hate to break it to you. This is going to go nationwide here in probably about two hours. So, uh, <laughs> Mrs. Fields, he is, you heard it right here first. We got That's your right. back. Uh, there's nothing like, you know, being a dad to boys, it's amazing. But let me tell you, I was in the same boat as you. I, uh, had my boy, he's 11 years old now. And I thought that was it, you know, no more. And then. I'm pregnant. We're having another kid. I found out it was a girl and my heart dropped. I said, me, this guy being a dad to a baby girl. No, but I'll tell you what, man, it's been the biggest and blessed blessing I've ever encountered. And it, 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 while it's great being a father to boys, it's amazing. It's a whole different ball game when it comes to girls. Um, and, and it's real special, man. So I'm rooting for you, man. I'm rooting for Mrs. Fields to get for that, for that to happen for you guys. And you got nothing to worry about, man. You, you're huge. You're going to scare all the guys away. So it's all good. You're, you're set. <laughs> well, you know, what, before I had kids, uh, it was kind of laid in my heart that um, in my career in law enforcement, I ventured out into the SVU and I'd done those cases until I had kids. And at that point, I just could not do them no more because every child was my child and it was just yeah. getting, and it was getting really to me. So, uh, that's a special kind of person to do that job, a great person. And I just can no longer do it because you don't understand how much you can love something like a child until you have a child. And, you know, you, you always think of a child and you think, oh, they're sweet. And, and, but when you have a child, it just, it's a different bar of, of love and appreciation for what you have. And, you know, so, you know, doing those cases and, and every time I see a case, my child's, um, popping in my heads and I couldn't do it no more. So now I moved out to the U S marshals and started kicking doors. <laughs> <laughs> well, that works too. Yeah. I mean, I, and, and thank you, by the way, I know it's, I, for one, I stand with you. I support law enforcement. I know it's crazy times we're living in. It seems to, 
it seems to have, at least as far as the media is concerned, and the news is kind of tapered down a little bit. The whole aggression and you know anti uh, police Semitism going out there, but I stand with you, man, and support everything you all do. It, it takes yeah. takes a special person to be able to do what you do to protect the lives of others and to do it right. So you know, thank you. Yeah, thank well, you. Man. Thank you. There's there's a lot of good people, and you know, the thing about that is is um. Yeah, you, know, you have bad and everything, but everybody's an individual. I know every cop's not a good father, every good cop, every cop's not a, a good husband. I mean, there's there's everybody's an individual. We're human, but there is a vast majority of really good men and women that works in the department to do this because it's a calling. I believe it's a calling from God that you're out there to protect against evil. And, you know, uh, a lot of the confusion about like I'm a deputy sheriff the sheriff's office and the confusion about people think law enforcement, they think government. But when you really look at what law enforcement or sheriff's office represent, they represent the rights of the people. So in other words, they're constitutional officers, uh, the sheriff's office is. And what that does is it holds the constitution in place because everything that we do by law is if someone has violated your rights, whether it be, you know, harm to you, your property, your, your civil. So any of that is what we get, involved with to protect your rights so not even the government can step in and violate those rights because we're constitutional officers uh, from the constitution so people think you get it twisted they get to thinking that police are the government or cops are the government or sheriffs are the government uh, really and truly we're here for the people to serve the people and to secure their rights so a lot of people don't understand that yeah but and, there's a difference there's a difference. And there's also a lot of, you know, social media. I blame a lot of it. There's a lot of bad information out there and a lot of minds that are easily swerved into believing something they read because their friends support it, which is just 100% false. And then it snowballs into it. And, you know, I'm glad we're clearing that up for you. So anyone watching this right now, you heard it from the man himself. That's, that's the way it is. It's amazing. Uh, I got a um, important question. I know it can be different for uh, any police officer out there, but for you in particular, Eric, when you leave that house every single morning, uh, leaving your kids, leaving your family in the position that you hold and the job that you have, how difficult is that on a daily basis? Before I answer that question, if I kill this light, I'm going to try to, I got to, I'm in the garage because uh -huh. I've got stuff going on, dogs barking and running around. So this is my peace area. But I got a fan right here and I don't, is a plug in. You care if I plug it? I'm sweating. Do your thing, man. Do your thing. I get it. I'm believe it or not, I'm not actually inside the Death Star right now either. <laughs> I'm uh I'm in my garage as well, my converted studio. How's that? Can you still see me? Yep, yeah. all good. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And that light makes so, you look even more like Dwayne Johnson, to be honest. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um the uh that's a good question because having kids, of course, I have a family, I have a wife, and I've discussed it with my wife. I, I even told her in some of these times to where uh, I've seen a lot of things in my career. Um, I worked a homicide with seven dead, uh, dead victims and uh, some of them some kids, you know, teenagers. And I've worked the SVU and uh, you know, I've done a lot of things, but when I, I know that I'm going to be that guy, I told my wife, I said, look, if something happens, I'm not going to run. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going towards it. I want you to understand that it's not me being selfish, but I can never live with myself knowing that I, I was a coward or I didn't do what I was supposed to. I didn't protect someone. So when that time comes, understand it's not me being selfish and taking me from y'all or not thinking of y'all. It's, I have to be that guy that, I'm going to be that. And if I die, that's know that it's, it's not out of selfishness. But you look at your kids and they're six and they're seven. And you're thinking, well, they know that I wasn't, you know, that I want to be the daddy that a lot of kids doesn't have. And I was raised by my grandparents. And, um, you know, I want to be that, that I, that I think is so important. And uh, I love them so much, but, when you leave the house, you wonder if something does happen. What what are they going to think? You know, that's enough time. Do they know me really? You know, and as they grow older, that kind of you kind of 
don't worry about that as much, but you just want them to know that they had a daddy and they, he loved them more than anything in the world. But, you know, yeah, you have to do, you have to, you have to do what you're called to do by God. And I have to go towards the danger. It's not being selfish because I just love it so much. I can't be anything else. Yeah. You know, I, you know, that's the thing is I told my wife, I wish I could be something else, but I can't, I'm called to do what I do. Now, if I may get called in life to do something different, uh, I might take a break. I might, I don't know. It's God's plan, but I, I let them know that well, I let my wife know, but I do think about that, you know, because you never, I mean, it could be a car wreck going to a hot call. It could be, uh, yeah. a shooting. it could be anything, but I just never want them to think that I chose the job over them. It's just, I am what I am and I love them more than anything. So is that, you understand that? Right? Absolutely. That, that yeah. clears it up hundred percent. As a matter of fact, yeah. I, you know, I can't speak for your family or your children or your wife, but I would think that it's the exact opposite of selfish. Now I'm pretty, you know, I'm certain your family and the ones closest to you probably can't take that role. If you know, something horrible were to happen, whether it be, but you know, as a guy on the outside looking in, that is 100% not selfish, man, doing what you do. Are you yeah, frozen to, on me to prepare for this one? Um, oh shoot. Hold on. Let's see if he comes back. Can you hear us, Eric? I can hear you. Can you hear okay, me? Okay, there you go. You're back. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. I prefer like the selfishness about the role is you're leaving and you got your kids saying, Daddy, why you gotta go to work? Daddy, stay with us, you know. And then you leave and something was to happen that day, you're thinking, they're gonna think I just left them. Yeah. So they don't understand. Yeah. That's kind of where I draw the selfishness. Go ahead, Nick. I get it. Yeah, yeah. I've got a I've got a good friend that works for the sheriff's department where, where I live in Grants Pass and he says basically the same thing and he does all kinds of like really cool things for his kids. They'll show up at school on their birthday, sing happy birthday over the PA for them. And it's just, you know, it's like they know more than anything that he loves them and, but he has a job to do. And, and it's kind of explains the same thing to his family. You just explained to us and it's, you know, they, they get it. And so it's, and you're right. As the kids get older, they do, they understand more and it's, it's, it's a, uh, yeah. And you know, that's the only thing that I guess are really, um, Really, I fear, you know, is I don't fear death. I don't, I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but, you know, I'm, I'm right with God and I have a job to do. I know that anytime I'm going to be walking into a, a dangerous situation, I just have to know. And before every hot call I go to, it's just something I do is, you know, I believe this is a calling of God. And uh, I, I pray to God to lead and guide me in the right directions uh, and and that his will be done and keep his hands upon us, knowing it's hurting everything. But, in, in the end, you don't want to be a victim of surviving. And what the, a victim of surviving is when you have to use force or, or lethal force or deadly force and you take someone's life, you're going to second guess yourself a lot. And you're going to really be keyed in. The world is going to, you know, I said the world, but the media and, and everyone is going to accuse you of wrongdoing. No matter if it was the only thing you could have done and you was 100% justified, you're always going to be accused when you have to do something like that, but you want to know in your heart and through God that it was good in God's eyes. And to keep that prayer every time you go to a call, just to get the satisfaction that it was God's will that was done to kind of smooth over the victim of survival, you know, because it, it's never a good thing to take a life, never a good thing. And the only reason you would do it is because you was a hundred percent convinced that your life or another life is at risk. So, you know, it, it, but it, it's a split second. So in a right. split second, you're going to go back and you're going to think, well, did I do, what if I done this? What if I got behind that? What if I could? Because you're going to learn the person. At the time, it's going to be an incident. It's going to be, it's going to be motion raised, drilling, kicking. And then after everything settles, you're going to learn that this is a father. This is a son. This is somebody else's baby. And it's really going to hit home. Nobody sees that in the officer. All they see is, well, the officer shot him six times in the back. Why did he do that? You know, he, he might have been reaching for a gun or a knife or whatever because the investigation hasn't came out yet. But the officer's going to second guess, well, what if I had just walk around the vehicle? You know, so that's the victim of surviving. Nobody talks about it. Oh, I'm glad you got a platform to talk about that. That's important. Oh, 
Okay, we're going to ease back out of the seriousness here. And I have I have a question about your kids. What so six and seven year old boys? I know what my boy loved when he was six or seven. What what are your kids into right now? What is their favorite thing? Well, I want them to love Ghostbusters really bad because I was a Ghostbuster when I was a kid. And nice. uh, we played it when we were young and I made them all kinds of stuff and we got little proton packs. But they're, they're <laughs> moving more um, uh, Among Us. Yeah. I love the Among Us. Um, so I actually went to Walmart and I bought them a blow up Among Us suit. <laughs> I got the thing that they do that they love. And uh, every. Every night, it, not every night here lately because it's been, but when I'm home, I get, I got this uh, mask that I made out of, uh, it was, uh, you know, like a, what's the bag the potatoes come in? The, the, you know, it's like. The, the bag the, the that bag what? The bag the potatoes come in. Burlap, oh, yeah, burlap, burlap sack. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I got a burlap bag and I got holes cut in it. I call myself Scarecrow. Uh -huh. And what I'll do is I'll take and I'll cut the breaker off in the house. <laughs> They'll be playing and doing whatever. I'll cut the breaker off in the house. They'll get their flashlights and I'll run around. And I'll be stopping and Scarecrow. So they had those they had those Among Us suits on and they're, they're the ones that have the fan. The air blows in. And yep. It blows up real big. And it was the funniest thing. Because I'm running around. I'm scaring them. And they're. They're falling like a like a turtle that can't get up. Uh -huh. <laughs> just, My so son was one of those for Halloween last year, and never again, for the record. <laughs> Going through a neighborhood with that fan on and trying to keep it in, that's good stuff. Yeah, my my baby girl's eight, and they're uh, I mean, she's probably in there playing Among Us right now. Not even kidding. It's crazy what these kids like these days. What happened to yeah, action so figures? Yeah, you guys are so lucky. <laughs> my, my, ba my baby right now is into Coco Melon, so it's all day – singing nursery rhymes all freaking day long. <laughs> it's, well, that's it's what so you signed up for, man. 40, I know. 41 year old man with a one year old baby action figures. I've got like all the GI Joe's ready for him. All back over here. <laughs> all the GI Joe's. <laughs> he won't even like them. I mean, I know, gonna, you know, it's going to be like, it's, I want him to like what I want. Cause I'm like, let's play this, you know, like, oh, let's play this. Yeah, I know. They, I yeah, buy see, I'm okay if he doesn't like him though. I tell my wife, I'm like, it's for the baby, but they're they're really for me. You're, yeah, you're <laughs> collecting. Yeah. They yeah. would rather watch videos of other kids playing with toys than play with toys themselves these days. Yeah. Yes. So yes. you know, it's strange. I, it, it may be a bit hey, controversial. Yeah. I drive a patrol car. You know, kids love that. Mm -hmm. My kids run out to see the garbage truck because that's what they love. <laughs> <laughs> Have you taken them on rides and, and lit that thing up? And then that, that doesn't that doesn't excite them at all. It excites me. They were, I guess, they were born in, you know, so they're just like, well, yeah, that's, that's that's normal. It also scares yeah, the hell out of me it. if I'm going to admit it, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, when I was a kid, I wasn't the I wasn't the best of kids. We're, we're, we're a, I'm a good, upstanding citizen these days, and a father and all. But I think that from being a teenager and, and getting pulled over so many times for speeding tickets and other things and whatnot that it's carried over now into my forties. I'm almost 50 and uh, it's still, I'll see someone else get lit up. <gasps> oh, what am I doing? I'm fine. Eh, I guess it's a muscle memory or something along those lines um, to get my kid out doors, especially right now in the backyard to do something. I figured out what he likes and I'm cool with it. Mom is kind of on the fence, but airsoft guns and BB guns. He, you know, with the proper training and, and the know-how. I mean, come on. I was eight years old when I got my first BB gun, but now he's he's out there still. It's right outside that door. I can hear it going off. Setting up his target, shooting down cans, and airsoft gun, but he's outside. He's not on the computer. He's not on his iPad. And uh, I, I, I call that a win in my book, as long as, you know, and teach him, teaching him safety, doing it right. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean that's that's how you that's how you learn. I mean, if you, if you go straight to the to the big thing, you know, you're not gonna you're gonna be fresh. But if you're a kid and you learn, the, like when I was a kid, uh, I, my granddad was a big hunter. We hunted a lot, so I had toy guns. And when I was around my granddaddy, he would not let me, he would whip me if I pointed a toy gun toward him. Yep, I had to do the same so, thing today. Yeah. So <laughs> it was it was about so he, when I became a cop, they're like. Put your gun on them, tell me again. I'm like, oh, this don't feel right, you know. So I have to learn that all over again. But uh, 
yeah. So, you know, teaching them young, that's what makes them understand the dangers and, and gives them that, that gut feeling, oh, this feels wrong, you know. So, yeah, I think that's good. Is I, uh, Sorry. So I started teaching the baby some MMA stuff. I took the, uh, <laughs> the heavy bag out in the living room because he's like, he, every time I go in and exercise, he's, he wants to come in and watch and join. So I took the, the MMA grappling bag out and did a little video. He's punching it and trying to kick it. And now he punches and kicks mom. So I got in trouble <laughs> for that one. <laughs> See, daddy do. Yeah. Daddy do. He's only, he's only one and a half. Like what? It's crazy. You put a kid. Yeah. put a guitar in his hand, man. Maybe it's a drum I set. Know. See what happens then. Well, I, there's so much money in UFC. I'm like, you know, get him trained now. <laughs> by the time he's <laughs> you're starting your time kid he's to 18, be... we might be famous enough to get Dana White to pick him up. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, are, are your? Is Daddy a sports fan? Is Eric a sports fan? And and if the answer is yes, are the kids into sports? Uh, I'm a yes. I'm a. I, I always play sports my whole. Fly. I mean, I played basketball, baseball, I ran track, I played uh, football. I mean, I played everything all the way up to, to high school level. And um, actually, I just played a men's football league and pulled my bicep. Um, <laughs> but they haven't got into the sports yet. And it was because right around the time they were getting old enough to really get into that, uh, you know, COVID. Yeah. And we had issues and stuff so they haven't got warmed up to that um but they they do have they watch sandlight so we're out the backyard we're playing uh ball all the time and stuff but they've not been on a team no and i really feel guilty about that because things have want you know winded back to where we're kind of getting a little bit more uh active in the, and so but i feel uh i feel guilty that they're not playing on the team. It's just like we got I got so much going on with my wife, so much going on. It's like, ah, you know, and she just told me the other day we're gonna sign one for basketball. She says, you know, they're not gonna be on the same team. I'm like, ah. so you know, every single night we really want to be somewhere. Yeah. So <laughs> is it you know, is it roll tide for uh Lieutenant Eric Fields? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean that's number one. I mean, come on. Oh, it must be good being you. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a lot of success for a long, long time. I'm, you know, I'm from Southern California, so I'm in a little bit of a drought. I'm a USC Trojan fan. I'm not very well liked up where I live nowadays, which is in Oregon. So every time I say that, but yeah, that must be nice, man. You got a good, good football team over there. Yeah, I mean, it's it. It wasn't always like that. I remember when I used to be young and. Um, you had Mike DeBose, he clapped with it in wrong or good. You know, he just clapped yep. on the sideline. Like, ah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we got a good coach, and uh, he, he's got real strong moral values about how he coaches, and that's real good, too. I mean, some people, they don't like him, and but he's just a very uh, very strict man, and I think they take well of that, that age, you know, to, be, to have boundaries and to have guidelines and structure, and that really – Keys them in to focusing on what they need to focus on, what they want to focus on. So I think it's good. People think it's bad, but you know. <laughs> All right, I'm bounce back here. There was a day, I'm guessing close to eight years ago in your life, where two words were told to you. I want to know what your immediate emotional reaction was to it when you heard, I'm pregnant. Well, that was um, – actually, I was working out, and she came home from work, and she uh, she looks at me, and she just starts – and we've been married for five years at this time, okay? So um, we, we, we wanted to have kids, but we, we've never had made – we're going to do it this. And she was in college to become an RN. She was an LP in the hospital. So she comes in, and it's probably around 8 o'clock at night. And she walks into this garage and she says, she just looks at me and says, she's got to tell me something. And she just bust out crying. I'm like. Were they, were they happy tears? Sad tears? You didn't know at this moment? She's crying. Right. So I'm saying, did you ever, you wrecked the car? (laughs) I'm going going through all this. Like, what did you do? Right. You know, I was panicking. I'm like, oh my God, this is bad. She's done something, you know, hit and run. What's up? (laughs) So, uh, so she says, I'm pregnant. And I just said, 
oh, baby, that's great. And I took her, I hugged her, and I, you know, I'm scared to death because I'm thinking, oh, God, I don't know about this. I'm a really good daddy, you know, because that's a big thing. And, uh, I'm a self-made man, so I have to learn as I go on this. And um, We're still learning I'm, as we go, by the way. Yeah, well, yeah. Every day. <laughs> But but I'm hugging her. And I'm saying that's gonna be okay, baby. That's great. That's awesome. You know. I'm thinking. You know. You know. Is it mine? I'm just joking. <laughs> but you know, I, you I'm gonna ask. Her that it's gonna be okay because she's she's just uh, very upset about it, and because uh, she's in school and we we hadn't planned this, but it was a blessing and uh, continues to be a blessing. But uh, that's how it worked out the very first time that she came home and said she was pregnant. She just kind of. I think she was just like she wanted to tell me. She couldn't tell nobody. She held it in when she took a test at work and uh, comes home and just emotionally drained and bust us out. So it was sweet. All right. Uh, and then you were all good. You were excited, ready to go. You had that fear, though. Well, you know, I had the fear is uh, we're ready for this. But we've been married five years. We were stable. And um, I was worried about that part of, you know, is that part, but I was kind of just, I don't know what to expect. You know, you just, you're going at this, you're thinking, oh, you know. and I'll tell you the, the other part about that. So when he was born, we're in the, we're in the uh, hospital. So we, we take him in there because he's done, you know, he had to be evicted because he stayed too long and we had to come up with a date for them to uh, induce her because he wasn't moving out. So, <laughs> We get up there and and she goes in labor because they give her the, the medicine that, that puts you in the labor and she's going to have the baby and she's going to do it natural and, uh, you know, no C-section. So I'm in there. The nurse comes in. It's time to have a baby. Well, when she was having the baby, uh, his head, his body was so long and, and she's, you know, she's her pelvis. He was he wasn't coming all the way out. And I'm in there and I, we're delivering it. And I mean, I'm helping in this and they got this suction that they put on the baby's head and they pump it up and they pull and uh it, it goes pop right off the head came off I'm like, oh, oh my no God, I'm, I'm freaking out <laughs> so we go through this very traumatic experience because he was hung and in that time period when he's hung you know is when the baby could get brain damage or die because they can't get him out during the uh the birth so he's hung back and forth Finally, we get him out. I mean, we're putting, I mean, it's literally putting leg up there, pulling, and I'm on, I'm in this, you know, I'm, I'm up there. I'm in it. But the doctor's looking at me. I mean, we're, we're working together. So when I say delivered the baby, I delivered the baby. Um, so when the baby comes out, uh, he's, he's purple. And, um, so, so I look and I don't know, I don't know anything about this, you know, so I look at my wife, she's busting out crying. And she said, He's not crying. And uh, I'm like, oh, my God. So so I'm looking over here, and he, he starts crying a little bit, and they're cleaning him off. Well, I don't get to go for it because they rush him to NICU, and they say, you know, you go with him. And so I go to the NICU, and I don't, I don't know. I'm scared to death because I'm thinking, is everything okay? You know, nobody's saying anything because it's just it's rushing off. So I go to the NICU. Uh, they wash, they clean him off. And I was actually the first one to have contact with my first son because – he reached down and he grabs my finger, you know, while they're cleaning him up and they put the diaper on him. And so he, he kind of gets a little better. So he's going to be okay. You know, and he's, he's breathing fine, doing good. So I go back down to the emergency room or the delivery room to my wife and, and she's in there, they're all in panic again. I'm like, what's going on? So she, she won't stop bleeding. And, and the doctor's like, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. so I'm like, uh, you know, I'm fixing to lose both of what I have because they're in a panic. So I go to the elevator door. I'm going to go to the elevator door. I had to go from one floor to the next. And all the family was out rushing up to the door. And I just, I couldn't say nothing. I just started crying and said, and went back in the elevator because I couldn't say what was going on. It was so emotional. I yeah. was, I'm trying not to cry now. I'm going to put these glasses on. <laughs> Uh, it, it was so emotional and, but you know, that little boy, and I remember we went home, he stayed in the NICU. So we went home and, uh, we went home without our son and it was just, we both cried over that little meal they give you with the great 
buzz loop, right, that you, you get, you know. So we went home with that, and it just didn't feel right anymore. But he, he's perfectly – I mean, super smart. No side effects to any of that. Perfectly healthy. Just a great gift. And, you know, the whole time, if you, you know, when you first become a father, you don't make fun of nobody because you're thinking, you know, even even your, your dorky cousin. You're like, no, no, we don't want to get a little like that. You know, so let's just say, uh-huh. don't make fun of me. Like, you're pregnant. Because uh, it changes the way you look at things. And we were so blessed that he was just so healthy. And uh, he came home and, and he's super smart. I mean, great kid. His head was a little, you know, not, you know, because we pulled on that thing pretty hard, but it, it grew back. So <laughs> my, my, uh, my lady also has a, I don't, I don't know if also, but she has a, a small frame. We'll just put it that way. And my son has a very large head like his dad. And on the way out, broke my lady's tailbone. Broke her coccyx, clean in half on the way out. That poor thing. But that was that was it. And, and you know, when my kid was born, there was, there was really no complications. It was super smooth except for that. Uh, you and Nick, though, however... I can tell. I was looking at your eyes and shaking your head. You got a lot in common when it comes to uh, craziness and scared nervousness yeah. when it comes to birth. He, his kid. Go ahead, tell uh, the story, Nick. Yeah, I've had so I've had six kids, and my latest baby. He uh, was born last year, and right when COVID was ramping up, and he ended up going to the NICU. So I got to see him like once a week for three months, and it was it was scary. They only let one of us go with him, so my wife went and stayed with him the whole time, and. Yeah, it was it was scary. Like he he didn't know how to eat when he came out. So at that fix, he got E. coli really bad somehow and ended up getting really, really sick. And so it was definitely really scary. But now he's totally healthy and a little hellion. Yeah. Beating <laughs> up mommy because he wants to be that's, in the MMA. That's right. Exactly. And that's that's great because you never know what to expect when that happens, especially that young with any comp- any type of complications that you don't have. Mm-hmm. And 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 you see other babies. That has complications, and uh, just you just think, you know, what's this going to happen? What's going to happen with this? Because you know, a lot of the complications, like when, when a baby is trying at birth, like when he was purple, sometimes the oxygen that at that time that's cut off causes issues, and um, it's just it's very very scary, especially when you don't know anything. Yeah, it was it was it was more scary hearing the doctor say everything that could go wrong instead of the things that could go right. And you're like, just give me some good news. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, yeah. When when is when does this get better? And yeah, so that that was definitely like the most nerve wracking part of okay, all these things are gonna go wrong. And you're like, oh gosh. But you know, luckily he figured it out and he's like just like your kid, he's totally healthy and just a little rock star. Love that. All right. You, someone brought up earlier COVID. I'm curious, uh, cause this particular episode, by the way, uh, Eric, Nick, um, I'm not holding back on this one. I'm actually going to produce it when we're done and I'm going to okay. get this thing out today or tomorrow. So this is going to, you know, we have so many guests and so many shows in the can, Eric, that we've got stuff that like drops next week that we did three months ago. I don't want that to happen this time. I because yeah. I, mean, I, I want to hit on your popularity as a viral <laughs> superstar as it is. Um, but anyway, the reason I'm asking that or telling you that is I'm curious to how are things in your neck of the woods when it comes to COVID. Um, I'm going to ask a couple tough questions in a minute, but how is it in your area as far as infections and 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 the mystique around it, and how's everyone taking that? Well, I live in Alabama. So that being said, we're more in the Bible Belt of things. We get little things a little later, and uh, the government don't really freak out as much, you know, over violations constitutional code. So, so we're we're all making it really fine, and you know, there is sickness, and COVID is real. People think people think COVID's not real. COVID's real, and it does affect people, and, and some of all types of people, it makes them very sick. We just don't know why it's targeting these people yet. Yep. You, know, you know, it could be a young person, old person, whatever. So there is sickness, but it's not, there's a lot of COVID that has, you know, coming to the hospital. There's not a lot of beds, you know, being taken 
or a real sick patients. Every now and then you have a person who's 38 years old, never had any type of uh, sickness, not over, not, not asthma, not obese, nothing very healthy. And they're, they're really, really sick, you know, may not come off a ventilator. And then you have, so it just skips around, but we don't know enough about that. But as far as the communities, you know, they're still, you, the vaccine's optional still, and you, you wear a mask is optional. We don't have anybody. I haven't had anybody. Social media is terrible, but in real life, arguing about the mask lately, I mean, it's since this second time, it's been more of a, uh, you see people that's not wearing a mask, you see people that are wearing a mask, shopping and talking and and hey, hey, you know. Right. So it, it, it's a little bit better. I mean, that, that mask thing in the beginning was just a, it was a very big, uh, very big. Yeah, very hot topic. Um, has yeah. the uh, presidential mandate reached to you in your uh, precinct or uh, neck of the woods as far as your employment? Has that hit, hit where they're asking police officers to get vaccinated, otherwise you can't work? No, I mean, uh, federal government can't tell a sheriff that, you know, he's an he's elected official for the, of the people, right. by the people. Um, now, police departments, they fall differently because they are of a city that has, you know, that's different. The mayor appoints a chief and all that kind of stuff. So it's not the same as being a deputy sheriff, and we're not federal. So we don't represent the federal government. We represent people's rights. So, no, our sheriff is a very good Christian man, and the governor has put a, how does she say, uh, she, you know, they want to court about the legalities on uh, whether that's uh, a violation of right or not. So it hasn't been. We do we do offer the vaccine. We have it comes into our jail. We try to give it to uh, you know jail the, the staff and uh, jail correction officers, inmates. And uh, people that want it to have no sheriff's office. So we do have a supply coming in. We have a medical board at the jail, you know, a nursing staff that do uh, the vaccine. But nothing has been forced as of yet. Okay. It would be slow. It would be slow knowing the kind of the leaders that we have. Because he, he believes in doing just what he believes is right, you know. So right. when can you be when you're giving somebody uh, a choice. Yeah. There you have. And that's what I believe too. We've actually had uh, yeah. some of our local uh, representatives, city council members, commissioners. Uh, we've had business Doctors. owners to get a few sides of that. Uh, Cause we've actually in Southern Oregon where we live, uh, we were ranked recently. It's getting better by the way, but two, three weeks ago, we were the nation's uh, highest percentage of new infections of this Delta variant. And it was just seemingly like, no one cared. No one was doing yeah. anything about it. And so we had a few podcasts discussing that, getting all sides of it. I was just curious how it was over there. Glad to hear it's not as seemingly as bad as it is there. But as as I mentioned, it is getting a little bit better. Um, so that's good. Yeah. Enough COVID yeah. talk. I hope I hope this thing goes away and we don't we don't hear about it no more. But you know, I just did hear on the radio mentioning about the vaccine being mandatory that FDA is trying to get through and approve kids ages five and up. And that is, I'm dead set against, you know, with, with a 99.9% death rate overall in the average, and then kids just now being in this new variant that that is a mixed argument about how dangerous the new variant is, you know, versus the old uh, COVID. I really don't want to be forced to give my child something that has been studied that it makes them infertile for one. And there has been, there's been people that has really became paralyzed from the vaccine just because it's affected them differently than other people. I don't know how many percentage, but you know, until we, until we know enough, my children are healthy and the survival rate is, it's got to be far better than the overall percentage of, of the survival rate. If the survival rate is 99.9%, .9%, what's the child's survival rate? Why would, we, why would we be mandatory to give them, you know, something? Yeah. And that's, that's, again, that goes along the whole 
choice thing. And as a parent, I mean, I, I, I want nothing more in the world than my kids to be healthy and safe. Now, if I have a choice between giving them a vaccine or them getting sick with it, it's, and then I myself am vaccinated. I'll tell the mm-hmm. world I've been saying it. But when it comes to giving the kids a vaccination, that is a whole new Pandora's, Pandora's box you're opening, Nick, in my opinion. I'm, and yeah. I don't know where I, I don't know where I stand with that. I yeah. want to keep them healthy <laughs> and the percentage is so low, but I don't want them to get sick with COVID because there's also a percentage of children who, and I know family members and friends who've had children nine years and younger who have passed away because of the virus. That's difficult one, man. That is, that is a, that is a super duper pickle. That's a tough one. So I've been an anti-vaxxer my whole life. I completely against vaccines. I did get vaccinated um, only because of personal experiences of being around people that were vaccinated. When I got COVID, they didn't get sick and also not wanting my little guy to have even the slightest possibility. If I could do something to myself to make it to where he could not possibly get sick or, or whatever. I, you know, I took one for the team and if I'm still alive, I'm not a zombie yet. So it's, uh, I, you know, that's, that's a good thing for me. Um, but I, I agree with JP personal choice. You know, if you don't want it, don't get it. Um, yeah. talk to your, talk to your doctor. They, they, they know your health. You know, I don't know somebody's health. So I'm not against the vaccine at all. I mean, I don't, it's not an argument of, uh, yes or no, but the big issue is, we're talking about children. So if you had a chick, chick, if you had a sick child and, and you forced feed him yeah. versus you get him interested in something and let him make that choice of eating it and how well he does with both. You know, if we're taking society and we're force feeding them something, it's going to be a bigger rebellion than if we would have just offered the goodness in, yeah. in, in, in front of you. So that's where I think you know, like you're vaccinated, he's vaccinated, he was against vaccination. But now he might not have the same opinion if, if it would have been during the time of, hey, you're going to get it no matter what you think or believe. Right. Because now, whoop, no, I ain't doing it. I am not doing it. But definitely, because it just pushes people away. So yeah. if you want your true vaccination, you must have, this is America. You know, give me liberty, give me death. We're free people. We're not used to this <laughs> kind of shoving down your throat type deal. Right. And you're going to have rebellion. That's what Americans yeah. do. So exactly, and by, I don't think they should have called it a vaccine. It should have been called a booster. It it, it doesn't it doesn't protect you from getting the virus. And then and then you'd have the anti boosters too, Nick. Right? It, it would <laughs> it'd go on that. So yeah. Okay. So anyway. anywho, how about them Dodgers, huh? <laughs> right. All right. We're good. I, I, I'm going to bring I, I, up, I did a fast five. If you want to jump into fast five. Oh no, no, no. We'll get, we'll get into a fast five in a okay. bit, but uh, awesome. I have, I actually, I'm going to plant a seed and then you two are going to grow that seed into something beautiful. And I know it's right up your alley, Nick. And I guarantee Mr. Lieutenant Eric Fields. It's up his alley. Talk about your workout regimen. And go. Oh, I thought you were going to drop. Should we tweet Dwayne the Rock, Rock Johnson right now? No, <laughs> no, no, no. We're not dropping names just quite yet. <laughs> yeah. So how, how, yeah, how, how do you get as big as you got? <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I played ball all my life. So once, once I became an adult, you know, I really didn't even send out tapes uh, during my last year because I didn't want to go to college playing ball because I was so burnt out. It was four hours every day, you know, after school and this long day. You have 12-hour days it's every day and on Sunday. And, and I played every sport, so there was never an off-season for me. So I was really burnt by the time that uh, my high school career ended. And um, I didn't want to play ball. So, um, but once I became an adult, I missed the – activities every day of being active and something like that. So workout became the fill that void is where I went to really focus and, and push myself, you know, that athletic competitive that you, you had since, you know, you're a small child, I'm pushing myself inside the gym and it just becomes something that was like people make a mistake when they plan their day and then their workout. You have to plan the day around your workout. 
In other words, I'm getting this done because that's important. That's your health. You know, that's how you feel. That's, you know, so that's my coffee. I get up in the morning, I drag myself to, <laughs> to the kitchen, and I get myself a pre-workout. I drink it. I come to the gym. I, 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 and then I have a great day. Now, some people, I, I used to not do that. I used to do the email, but I couldn't sleep at night. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it kind of made its way to where I was doing it before work, and I just have a really good, refreshed day. You know, you come in, okay. you, you feel good, and it was my coffee. And it's, it's been my coffee for, for years. So that that's how it's the mental, you know, when you prepare yourself strongly mentally, it's going to show on the outside. So it, it's it's preparing yourself mentally, putting that part, making it a lifestyle, and then, you know, there you go. I do struggle. I've been struggling lately with, I'm like, ah, I'm not going to work out today, you know, because I guess I'm getting older. But uh, <laughs> you have to. You have to say no, you know, because I also come in when I work out to push myself mentally is I, I picture myself in a bad rip where I'm, I'm really giving it everything I got. I'm thinking, okay, you're going to fight for your life. Mm-hmm. You know, this is it. This could happen. What do you do? You're going to give up? Gonna, so my mind, I'm arguing myself. Come on, man, it's just working. No, you're going to give up? That's what's going to happen to fight. You know, you put yourself. So I do that. So Nice. Yeah, I get up at 4 a.m. every day. I'm at the gym by 4.45, start my day. That's how I started. Um, if I miss a day, I feel like I'm cheating on myself. But, uh, you know, the last eight months, I've been going as hard as I can. I've lost, like, over 80 pounds. I was, uh, I went and looked at some videos of when we first started this thing and I'm like, Oh my God, I was big. <laughs> I got up to almost 300 pounds. And he's only started. five foot two for the record. Yeah, I'm five foot eight on a good day. Come on. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's just, I'm like super motivated. I'm like almost got a six pack. I'm like, so I'm, you know, 40, I'm going to be 42 in a couple of days. So it's just, it's kind of a, a big thing for me to motivate other older guys that are like, Hey, you know, I'm just like, had older. My day and like you know, older guys. You know, yeah, we're, we're not we're there older, yet, Nick. Man. We're not older yet. Older to us 40. is like sixties. And we're in our forties, dude. We're older. <laughs> <laughs> Come to the gym with me. We're like, we're the old guys. We're not, yeah. we're not the 15, 16 year old, 20 year olds that are. No, older. no, we are not. So yeah. Eric, when you are through with your, uh, career in law enforcement and your kids are giving you grandbabies. Have you thought about what the next chapter holds for you as far as work? Or is it going to be till you retire and that's that? Well, I mean, I can retire at 46 years old. That's actually like eight or nine more years. Mm -hmm. We're still a young man. So my career, um, I don't think I'm ready to retire at that age. Because I'm still, I still feel that calling strong. So I mean, I might run for sheriff, you know, once I can retire, you know, because I have nothing to lose at that point. And if I don't get it, it's not God's will, and I'll just move on to something else. But um, you know, it depends on. I'm not a politician, so if you want a professional law enforcement officer as your sheriff, then you vote for me. If you want a politician, then it's not going to vote for me because I'm I'm very to the point. What's right, right wrong is wrong and we're not making deals about that so if you want a professional sheriff professional law enforcement officer that's made that career that's who i would be it just depends because in time sometimes that's what people want sometimes that's not what people want you know so when that time comes where are we going to be in society will be pretty much what gets me i'm not changing so well I hear the WWE is looking for new talent, so I'm just saying that is <laughs> well, always an option. I'll be as old as you guys, then, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nick. So every right. episode, we uh, we do a, a to, to finish off our interview, give or take a couple minutes. We do what we call it's Nick's Fast Five. It's five questions. You try not to think about it too hard. Answer quick off the top of your head, and I might add a few questions after he's done. And uh, so, this okay. questions for you. That's right. No one told me there's going to be a test. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like to surprise you. But no, no, exactly. this isn't a multiple choice either. It can, you know, we'll see. Yeah, you're going to need those yes. for the first question. There it is. There know go. your role, jabroni. I'm right. talking to Nick. What? I was talking to you. I wouldn't call oh. Lieutenant Eric Fields a jabroni. Okay. I'm like, I hope not. He can kick your ass, dude. You see that guy? <laughs> Let's do this, man. All right. <laughs> All right. First question. 
Dwayne Johnson called and asked you to be a stunt double. Would you do it? Yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. Question number two, favorite meal to cook for your kids? Uh, spaghetti and meatballs. Good choice. Yeah, and that's my daughter's current favorite meal, by the way. If, if I were eating carbs, that would be my favorite meal. I miss <laughs> carbs. <laughs> All right. Your funniest parenting fail. Um, is that a question? Yes, it is. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, we were taking a picture at Bridge Street, nice small, and he's peeing in the bushes behind us. So <laughs> <laughs> Did you get the picture? Yeah. I mean, we're like, oh, my God. You know, he's in the picture behind us, and he's, he's peeing in the bushes. Like, that's a nice place for statues and everything. Oh, that's so, great. Uh, you got to show that to the future girlfriends, man. That's good stuff. Yes. All right. Okay. Favorite thing about being a dad? Uh just my legacy is my life. They are my legacy in my life. So I love it. Awesome. This is one I ask everybody. If you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would it be? Uh, find God. Period. That, yeah, that's find God. Yeah. Period. Find, find, that's the answer to everything. Find God. There you go. And there is Fast Five with Lieutenant Eric Fields. Wow, it's good stuff. Uh, I, I like to add one. Uh, it's not really part of the Fast Five, but I, I've been curious this whole hour we've been talking with you. When did you know you wanted to take that path into law enforcement? Was it always bred in you, or is it just something it, it happened one day? Well, you know, when I was a child, funny enough, I wanted to be an actor action star or a stunt man or a law enforcement officer. And, uh, you know, that's what I played when I was a kid. And I love, I love law enforcement. And I remember I worked as a, as a teenager in the construction in through school in those summers, making money. And, and, uh, once I became an adult out of school, I, I was still in the construction work, but daddy owned the business. And I was a lead man. And I thought, you know, I'm going to do law enforcement. And I went, took the test and got on the chair or something. So, uh, ever since then, it's been a brand. I've just been, that's been what I've been good at. And just stayed with it. And, uh, I've been doing it for well, 17 years. There you go. He is Lieutenant Eric Fields out of uh, Decatur, Alabama, Montgomery County uh, Sheriff's Department. I, right? Did I get that right? Morgan County. Board, okay. Got it. Board, boarding. Got it. And he has been our guest here on DadCast. I just want to tell you, man, it's been a pleasure. It's a, I am so happy you took the time uh, out of your day to do this with us. It's been fun. It's been real. You got something for us. Yeah, let me tell you one more daddy story that was just so cute that, that made my day with all this. So when all this hit, which I, you do know why I've been using my platform for the ALS and Sergeant Miller. You know, you know yes. That, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I saw that. So, so all that was going on. Well, my son comes out one morning and working out and he says, Daddy, he says, who's cooler? Uh, you're the rock. And I said, well, that's the eye of the beholder, son. And he says, what's that mean? I says, what do you think? He says, you're cooler, Daddy. I said, like, yeah. So the next morning, the rock tweets me. He comes out the garage and uh, I'll read in the tweet. The rock said, you got on lips, play cooler. And my son goes, whoa, Daddy, that means you're the coolest guy in the world. So I'm in there taking a shower, getting ready to go to work. And life comes in. And she says, look what I talked to your son Googling on my phone. I'm like, oh, no. Eight years old. I mean, no, excuse me, seven years old. He's like, oh, my Lord, what could it be? You know, so I'm like, what? So uh, she goes, he's crazy about these plushes. Stuff, you know, for famous people or, or things, little stuff at them, people. Yeah, yeah. And so he's Googling a Lieutenant Fields plush. Because <laughs> That's awesome. Because was famous. So I, I thought that was the cutest thing. <laughs> Did he find one? No, no, he didn't. but you know, Nick, I got an idea no, and I want to talk to you when we're done. I like your ideas. I, I think you know where I'm getting at too. I we, think so. we know some people, Lieutenant, <laughs> we know some people, so uh, we might be able to make that thing happen. And, uh, man, if it puts a smile on daddy's face and a smile on your son's face, man, that's what we are all about. And Dwayne Johnson, if you ever actually getting a chance to check out this podcast, 
we'd love to have you on. Exactly. And if, and if Lieutenant Eric Fields can help us out in that <laughs> regards, you know, we'll take that help as well. You, good sir, have been amazing. Thank you so very, very much. Um, I don't, and this is normally part of the show where I uh, allow you to spout off all your social media and tell us about your next album or your next movie or your next TV show. But in this case, it's just keep up the good work. I'm proud to know you. I'm very happy uh, you came on the show. And uh, that's pretty much it, man. Nick, you got anything else? Yeah, man, I'm stoked. We got to talk to somebody that's the real deal. Yeah, like, you're real life hero, man. That's right. Yeah. I will say this about the, the social media. The only thing that, you know, Dillard's Warriors on Facebook, if you want to look up that, really and truly, he's got to go find me, and they use those funds to uh, get the house prepared for the Battle of Lies for Head because it's a vigorous disabled disease. He's one year away from retirement, 49 years old, and great husband and great father of, of two. So it's just a bad thing. He's a great guy. Through this, he still smiles. I'm thinking, how are you smiling? But he's a good guy, and... I'm asking not just for money, which that's a that's a huge help. Little little is a lot, but prayers because prayers is so much it's so much better than than the money. So if if anyone listens to this that wants to go and check out the Facebook, I don't know the GoFundMe link, but it should be on their Facebook. You can find it. It's Dillard's Warriors, and just it, it, she kind of reads about what he's going through right now and and giving him support, maybe a high from somewhere in prayer. Would be awesome. Absolutely awesome. And is it I'll D make sure we get that tagged in the video too? D I L L A R D S Dillard's Warriors. Yes. You got it. I'll also link it below. So anyone checking this out, uh, make sure you like us up, subscribe, and click that link below to check that out. And like you said, man, if you can do something amazing, if not a prayer, even better. And uh, we appreciate it, man. Lieutenant. Yeah, thanks, man. Thank you very much for your time, man. Um, I'm going to end it with a final question. And it's a good one, and and it's going to make you possibly commit. Every single year, so far we've done one, because this is a fairly new podcast and adventure for us, we do a Father's Day special. Now, it doesn't air on Father's Day. We do it about a week or two prior, but we try to bring back as many of the previous guests we had on the show the year before and do a, you know, like an 87 squares on the screen Brady Bunch type episode. Um I would love to have you back on for that episode if you are willing. Sure, I mean, you get I love it. Yeah, and yeah, and maybe by that time, you know, Dwayne Johnson will be right next to you in that same episode <laughs> because he will be a former guest on the show, and we'll get there. Um, but it'd be a good time, man. So we do look forward to seeing you again. As far as I'm concerned, that's a commitment. We will reach out to you when the time comes. And once again, everyone else, thank you so much for listening. Uh, whatever platform, however you may be listening or watching this episode, thank you so much. He is Lieutenant Eric Fields. That is Nick Martin. I am JP. Thank you very much. We'll see you all on the next episode.